Um, I'm a geriatric psychiatry consultant. I've worked at the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Centre for 32 years this year. And uh, I've worked always in geriatric psychiatry. And in the last 10 years or so, I've worked almost exclusively in uh, outreach and that's to long-term care. So many of you may have seen me wandering around in the halls with my wonderful colleagues, the outreach nurses at the long-term care facilities. And most of what we do in fact is the management of responsive behaviors in, uh, in dementia, in patients with dementia. So that's what I thought I'd talk about today. What we'll be talking about, um, is going to be uh, the, the uh, causes of some of the behaviors, the types of behaviors there are, and also the management strategies. I'm really hoping that you people will put your questions in the chat box because uh, this is not a comprehensive review. Many of you have much more experience and skill than I do at the bedside. And I'd be very interested if there's anything you can contribute in terms of um, other good ideas or any comments about what I have presented. And uh, any questions I'd be very appreciative of. So uh, there will be a moderator who will moderate the questions and at intervals we'll just stop and I'll answer the questions. So you can uh, keep them flowing all the way along and uh, I'll get back to them at intervals. Thank you. I'm just going to shut off my camera now for ease of presentation. Okay. So we're talking about um, the, the management strategies of behavioral disturbance in a response of behaviors in patients with dementia. And uh, you might ask yourself, why is this important? Those of you who work in long-term care will know exactly why this is important. It's because 90% of people who suffer from dementia uh, suffer from responsive behaviors. And in a home where there's responsive behaviors, as it, every home has, it affects the quality of life for the resident themselves for the co-residents who it's their home and they share this environment with the person with the responsive behaviors. It also can affect family and visitors that come into the environment, um, especially because they recognize this is their loved one's home and they don't want it to be disrupted by other people's behaviors. They may be fearful for their own loved one. And also for staff, especially with uh, behaviors that are repetitive, and difficult to manage, it can wear staff down and can lead to burnout. And in that situation, often we see poor outcomes for the residents themselves with behavioral disturbance. Kathy, it's Tara. We have a quick, an early question here. Um, it's, is saying responsive behaviors different from saying challenging behaviors? Just trying to understand the difference. Thank you. Right. So there's there's a number of phrases or, or words that we use to describe behavioral disturbance in dementia. So sometimes we call it behavioral disturbance. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as BPSD or behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as NPS or neuropsychiatric symptoms. That most of this terminology comes from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Illnesses, or the DSM that you can, uh, the American Psychiatric Association puts out. And years ago, it was called BPSD, and then it was called NPS, and now it's called BD. And um, these are just challenging behaviors. I think that's what most people who work in long-term care just call them challenging behaviors, but it's all amounts to the same thing. All right. So um, just gonna talk to you about what kind of responsive behaviors there are and why they might happen. Um, so, Behaviors can happen because of physical causes, and that may be things such as pain, um, nausea, feeling cold or feeling too hot, 
feeling uncomfortable in their seating. Physical causes like a wet incontinence product, hunger, thirst. Um, so those have to be taken into consideration. Psychiatric causes are also a significant contributor to behavioral disturbance. And we'll talk about those and the, the specific treatment for those. Um, also, they, uh, some people lack insight into their need for help and are willing are unwilling to give up control and independence. So they wanna participate in their own care. Um, they may not realize their own limitations. They may not want help from others. They may have been a very independent person who managed their own uh, privacy very well. People can be lonely, they can be bored, they can um, feel distressed in many ways that can cause behavioral disturbance. So the management of behavioral disturbance sometimes can be treated with medications. Um, even when medications are used, non-medication approaches should always be used. And many behaviors only respond to non-medication approaches. So the types of behaviors that respond best to medications are things like anxiety, low or depressed mood. In some people, we might see high mood or mania. Um, you can see uh, sleep disturbance, which can be a significant problem for people if they, especially if they switch their sleep wake cycle. Some sexually disinhibited behaviors can respond well to medications. Um, agitation and restlessness um, often do respond to sedating medications or anti-anxiety medications. Paranoia or other delusions like uh, the fear that you're being robbed or that you have no money to pay for your lodging or some people believe that they're very rich billionaires or that they have special powers. Those kinds of delusions or fixed false beliefs are treatable with medications. And hallucinations are also treated with medications. By hallucinations, I mean disorders of perception. And that's the five um, perceptual senses. So they can be auditory, visual, olfactory, which is smells such as like burning rubber or bad smells that, that can be related to hallucinations. Um, tactile hallucinations are the feeling that you're being touched or zapped by electricity. So those are all hallucinations. Um, so those can be treated by, um, by medications as well. Also restlessness and uh, verbally and physically responsive behaviors can sometimes be treated with medications. The type of medications that are used to assist with behavioral disturbance. Firstly, um, it's not on the slide here, but management of pain control. So if somebody has a lot of pain, which many of our residents do, uh, pre-medicating with main with pain medications prior to care uh, may be helpful. Also anti-anxiety medications, antidepressant medications are helpful. Um, some people require mood stabilizers, particularly if they have highs and lows or large swings in their mood. Antipsychotic medications are the ones that specifically treat delusions such as paranoia and the hallucinations. Antipsychotic, the word psychotic in, in that uh, word refers to the fixed false beliefs that are present in delusions and or hallucinations. Kathy, we had a question there, a couple. Yes. Um, sure. The first is, would CBD be considered as a medication? CBD is considered as a medication. Yeah, any, any chemical is considered as a medication. 
Mm -hmm. So CBD, maybe we can just digress into that for a little bit, because it's a very um, popular topic to talk about. So firstly, um, the use of cannabinoids in the treatment of uh, resistive behaviors or, or um, challenging behaviors in dementia is not well studied. It's not proven. What we do know is that cannabinoids can cause increased agitation, can lead to increased psychosis, things like paranoia and hallucinations. We also know they can be sedating. They have many interactions with other medications, particularly other sedating medications. And um, they're, they're not, their safety is not determined in seniors. Having said that, it's now legal for recreational use and for some medical uses. So people think that it must be safe because it's a natural product and um, that just simply is not true. They, I have seen it work for some people for pain or anxiety or for sleep. Those are usually younger patients and certainly in elderly people, it's a very difficult thing to dose accurately because each dispensing facility uses different formulas um, and different ways of calculating those formulas. So it's, it's very hard to determine what you're giving the patient and um, really researching in any meaningful way what the response is. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there is a pharmaceutical agent that is produced called nabilone, and that is a derivative of cannabinoids, and that is more, um, produced and um, approved by Health Canada. So that medication, it is known exactly what is in the medication. There's not any extra contaminants that we don't know about, which can happen in, with CBD. Um, so that medication can be used, but even as pure as that is, and as, um, it, you know, there are some studies to show usefulness, particularly in post-traumatic stress disorder, but it can also be used in behavioral disturbance in dementia. I've used it myself many times. Um, unfortunately, it also has a high risk of increased agitation and psychosis with it, as well as sedation and interaction with other medications. Thank you for yes. that. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. It was very helpful. So there are two other questions. The next one is, how as a BSO champion, uh, would you train staff to see triggers? I'm sorry, Tamara, could you repeat that? How as a BSO champion, would you train staff to see triggers? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> because triggers are the antecedents to the behavior. Right, so once you see the behavior, it's too late to see the trigger. Mm -hmm. But what people can do is see a, a you can do DOS or uh, the dementia observation scale and your facility may have a similar type of scale. And really what we're looking for is patterns of behaviors, for example, is it a particular time of day that that's happening? So if it's at the end of the day, could it be related to fatigue or just overstimulation from the day? Um, could it be pain related because the person's been out of bed too long? So those, those would be triggers, for example. Um, you might also notice that it happens during care. So it may be that the person is, uh, again, uncomfortable, cold, too hot. Um, maybe they're visually impaired, hearing impaired, they don't understand what's going on. They may have language um, issues such as aphasia, and they may require a more slow delivering of, of um, more slow and simple delivery of commands or requests for help. Um, so that if, if it's care related, you'll be able to see that on the DOS. Sometimes people will be resistive and, and upset during care, and then they'll remain anxious for a period of time after care. So that's another thing to look for. Um, so really looking for where is this happening? What's the environment? Is it during care? Is it in a noisy environment? Does it improve in a quiet environment? Is it during meals where it's so noisy and there's so much action around noise and smells and things to look at? 
Um, so that's really what you're, what you're looking for. So I guess the, in the summary of that is to do some behavior mapping, to try to see if it's a time of day, a situation or a specific trigger for the behavior and to look for consistency in that. The other thing is, is to specifically hone in on something like, for example, if somebody's resistive to care and it's specific around care that they're physically responsive, um, you want to see, is there a way to approach that? Is there a way to try a different approach, stop and go method, maybe to give them more control over, over what they're doing if it takes longer? to see if you can mitigate some of those behaviors. And then you can say, well, this clearly is a trigger. And it's important to say that as dementia progresses and as a person's situation progresses, maybe they're sick with COVID, um, their triggers may change according to that as well. So to be aware that triggers can change over time. Excellent, thank you for that. Yeah, so and the final question is, um, what are some of the downsides to medications that you mentioned? Well, there's always, there's always pros and cons to everything, even the non-pharmacologic approaches. So with every medication for every patient in every situation, you have to assess the risk of using the medication versus the benefit. So for example, if somebody um, responds to a noisy environment, by running away, that they, they get up and they run, that puts them at risk for falls. Um, if, if they're running away because they're anxious and panic stricken because of the noisy environment, say they hear somebody vocalizing and they, they feel fearful and upset, so they run away. The risk is that they might injure themselves. The benefit of uh, giving them medication in that situation is that they may not be distressed, uh, they may be able to stay in the environment. The risk of falling if they run away is so small that it doesn't warrant medicating in that situation. On the other, in, in my viewpoint, in, in another situation, you might have somebody who um, uh, grabs people around the throat when they vocalize. So they hear somebody vocalizing and instead of running away, they try to choke that person. And, um, yeah, and they have a history of doing that. Um, in that situation, your risk of medicating the patient outweighs, uh, the benefit of, uh, of giving the medication outweighs the risk because of the risk of harm to the other person. So each situation is like that and each medication is like that. So for example, you know, a very mild sedating medication such as a low dose of trazodone carries a lower risk than using, say, a high dose of an antipsychotic medication where somebody might have, um, you know, over sedation or falls, stiffness, um, they could fracture something if they fall. So you really have to assess which situation, the risk of the situation, the specific medication and the risk of side effects of that medication. So it's always a very delicate balance and, um, and you're, you're assessing multiple factors. So that's, that's the very important role of the RP, RPN as well, who's deciding on the use of PRN medications. So that's why um, usually doctors will give a fair bit of leeway with, with PRN medication. So they might give one or two PRNs of medication, perhaps something for pain and something for anxiety. And the RPN will have to decide, you know, what is the trigger for this? What is the best PRN to give in this situation? And to assess, is this the time to use that? What's the benefit? So for example, if, if somebody is going to be getting their bedtime medications in two hours and they're agitated, is it better to give the medication or to try a non-medication management strategy and perhaps give the bedtime medications an hour earlier? Um, so that's, that's the kind of decisions around the risk and benefit with medications. But definitely there's more risks in general to using medications to help manage behaviors than non-medication approaches. Thanks, Kathy. And just a quick comment. Um, 
Arlene said, isolation has been very hard on residents. It's a day by day in person. It's day by day in person by person for us. So I guess that was in relation to triggers. Absolutely. My goodness. I, um, I saw a woman yesterday at Laurier Manor who was in a moderate stage of dementia, but it, it, you know, not severe enough that she just wanted to get out there and play bingo with some of the people. And she was in her, her little half room in, a, in one of the older facilities. And, um, and she, we came in with our masks and you know, full PPE on. And she said, why are you doing that to me? And we said, you know, we're, we have to wear this. We're trying to explain to her, you know, we don't want to get that virus and we have to wear this. Well, she says, I can't see you. And, you know, so we get closer, we speak louder, we use her name, we try to validate her feelings. And she says, I don't understand. I just want to go play bingo. And they told me I have to stay right here for nine days. It breaks your heart to hear stories like that because these people just want to live their lives. It's their home. When you're confined to a, a space eight feet by nine feet for nine days, how does that feel to you? Everyone who comes in keeps their distance. They're wearing mask, visor, yellow plastic gown, booties on their feet. It's, it feels terrible to them. So absolutely, and I think that in the time of COVID, some people sort of get used to that. But again, you know, we could go in and out of phases where people are terrified of getting the virus. We think it's over, then another wave comes. And I think that these patients and ourselves, I mean, we get fed up of it. Imagine these poor residents who have a harder time processing this information. So it is important to, to validate feelings of residents that feel that way to explain why you're doing that. Use their name when you're talking to them. Um, use facial expression as much as you can under all this stuff. Use nonverbal um, uh, communication. You know, show them with your hands that you care about them because you can't hug them or pat them. The, the normal human touch that people can't feel, that they haven't felt really, except for brief episodes during this pandemic. So you're absolutely right. And it's, it's heartbreaking for all of us. We went into this vocation because we wanted to help people and to help them in the last part of their life. And here we are um, scaring them and making them feel isolated and alone. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. That's really, yeah, it's hard for everyone, for sure. Okay, any other comments or questions to Mary? Uh, nope, that's it for now. All right, so we're going to go on to talking about behaviors that are, are um, best managed with non-medication management, um, the non-medication approaches. So these are behaviors that are pretty common in long-term care. You'll recognize many of them. Um, most of them are troublesome and can be annoying. Many of them put the resident who suffers from these behaviors at risk of harm from others because they're um, not socially appropriate behaviors. And Often as a physician, I'm asked, you know, what can we do? What medication can we give to help Mrs. Smith to stop screaming all the time? She doesn't sleep all night. She's keeping everyone else awake. What can we do? Or, you know, what can we do about um, Susie? She keeps taking things from other people's rooms. She's rummaging through their doors, stealing their stuff and people are getting upset about it. Family members get upset about those kinds of things. You know, their, their loved one's dentures go missing or their glasses go missing. They turn up in somebody else's garbage or laundry hamper. So these are not insignificant behaviors. And the reason that we don't use medications to treat them is because they just don't work. Or if they do work, they work by a mechanism that would over sedate them or perhaps the, the risk of using medications outweighs the benefit. So the behaviors that I'm talking about are um, hoarding or collecting objects. Um, this is where people will 
stuff things under their shirts, into their wheelchairs, um, take them into their own room, maybe stockpile them. It's less risky if it's belongings and products around the unit and worse if it's food or liquids, things that can spoil that they might hide or stuff into small spaces in their room. Inappropriate elimination, and by that I mean people who just simply don't know where is appropriate to go to the washroom anymore. So they may do their best and try um, to use a receptacle like a, a garbage can or a laundry basket, or they may just not know at all and just respond to the urge uh, to urinate or defecate. People, um, many residents particularly, they have hyperorality or they're focused on their, their mouth, um, will eat inedible objects. Sometimes it can be things like gnawing on their own fingers or gnawing on their clothing or the clothing protectors. But sometimes it can be quite dangerous things like paper, strings, um, small objects that they might pick up off the floor. Um, wandering and exit seeking is another significant behavior. Um, often patients intent is not to exit the place, but they may leave by accident if the door is left open or for some reason they're mistaken for a visitor and they're let out. So that can be a significant issue, very difficult to to find a medication management strategy for that. Um, undressing. So people, uh, you know of people that will layer their clothing because they have a dressing apraxia or the inability to dress appropriately. Likewise, people can have undressing or disrobing, which can be socially inappropriate and can put them at risk for harm. Um, Vocalizations, that's probably one of the number one problematic behaviors that cannot be medicated. And that can be the most distressing thing for people around the vocalizing resident. The resident may vocalize because they're distressed or they may just simply vocalize. They may have just repetitive things that they say, chanting, singing, uh, particular phrases and um, or or sounds that are distressing to others unfortunately that's unless there's an underlying cause for that it's very difficult behavior to get rid of uh, sexually disinhibited behavior is another behavior that occasionally responds to medication strategies, but often does not respond fully to medication strategies. And this can be problematic, um, not only because it's socially inappropriate, but it can be risky for, for residents and for co-residents. And it also is something that the Ministry of Long-Term Care health and long-term care takes very seriously. So as many of you know, when incidents arise between residents, the police um, are often involved in that incident and there's investigations through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So these are incidents that we really don't want to occur for many reasons. On the other hand, uh, sexual expression is part of the human way of communicating. Intimacy is important. And there's real limits to that in long-term care. So we'll talk about some of the strategies to deal with that and uh, the need to assess risk for that. Um, looking at my list here. Ta oh, repetitive motor behaviors or, uh, or verbal behaviors. So repetitive purposeless movements. And you've all seen this as well. People that tap or bang on tabletops, um, people that hum repeatedly. So those kinds of purposeless behaviors and they can drive people a little, uh, dis make people distressed around them in that environment as well. Kathy, do you mind if I interrupt a quick question? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so it's why are medications not effective for vocalizations? Is it because the trigger is often unknown? Hmm. The trigger is, it's often unknown. We presume it's something going on inside the, person head, the person's head that they're responding to. Sometimes it's boredom, loneliness, um, 
a sort of a self-soothing thing that, that some people can do. Um, it, it's very hard to know why medications don't specifically work, but unless you really sedate the person to the point that they get, they go to sleep. Even if they're sedated, sometimes they'll continue to tap or have that behavior. So I guess the, the question is, why do we have to medicate it? Um, is there another way of dealing with it? Is there something else we can find for the person to do? Maybe a different place for them to be. If the environment's less stimulating, maybe they, um, they will have less of those repetitive behaviors. Maybe if the environment is more stimulating, they'll have less of those behaviors. So I think it's important to, to look at what risk there is to their vocalizing. If there's not a huge risk, then to just try to find non um, medication approaches. If there is a really high risk, um, certainly I have seen patients who vocalize loudly who are targets for others be placed on one-to-one -one high intensity needs to protect them from others. And that's more specifically because the medications really don't work well. So I, I don't know a good answer to that one. Um, I have an elderly cat you might hear in the background who has the same issue. So if somebody has a strategy for 15-year-old Siamese cats, I'd be interested to know that as well. <laughs> it's, it's nice to hear the cat in the background. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. All right. Um, and if anyone has answers to help that, the person who asked that very good question, um, please write it in the chat box because I, I would love to know after 32 years a way of addressing vocalizations. There is one comment. Uh, someone yeah. has shared that they support someone who vocalizes when she's bored and it's in the form of a grunt. So I wouldn't want to medicate her as this is her way of telling me she doesn't like an activity. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And people who are nonverbal may very well use vocalizations to communicate. So that's the other thing is, what is the meaning behind this behavior? Is the person in pain, wet, thirsty, cold, hot, anxious, depressed, you know, just really, really upset? Are they responding to hallucinations? Um, you know, all of those, uh, those things that we went through at the beginning, uh, those of you who have pieces training, that's what that's meant to do is sort of tease apart what could be behind this behavior. Yeah, so the original um, question, the person who asked the original question says she wonders if the vocalizations are often caused by hallucinations and would we want to stop hallucinations and would medication do that? Medications can stop hallucinations. In my experience, vocalizations are not usually because of hallucinations. Um, how do I know that? Hmm. I guess... You know, if somebody has hallucinations, there are ways of telling, like, are they seeing something in front of them? Are they looking specifically in the same spot and responding that way? Are they shaking their finger at something that doesn't appear to be there? Are they using somebody's name or addressing, you know, an animal here, kitty, kitty, something like that? Um, if they're having auditory hallucinations, sometimes it's a, what sounds like a one-way conversation. Um, if they're if they're smelling or tasting something bad, they might they might describe that or you know sound disgusted. Um, but olfactory and gustatory, those this smell and taste hallucinations are very rare, except in um, in things like epilepsy, seizure disorder, and some of the um, um, other neurologic disorders that can affect the, the cranial nerves. So I would say probably vocalizations are usually related to something other than hallucinations. The most common cause I would say is likely related to physical causes, anxiety, boredom, or, um, or no particular reason. Thank you. Yeah, and there's one additional comment. As a BSO champion, sometimes just holding a hand helps validating the resident in a good way. Absolutely. If we could have somebody one-on-one -on -one with every resident who wanted one, some people don't like one-to-ones, 
but for everyone who wanted one to sit with them, talk to them, hold their hand. Um, you know, the, the, the small things that we see some of the um, recreation staff doing, things like hand massage, painting somebody's nails, rubbing their arm, uh, just talking to them soothingly, reading them books or poetry or, um, you know, singing songs. Those things are so important because they engage the person. They make them feel human and grounded. And I, unfortunately, our long-term care facilities aren't set up to, to really make people feel grounded and, um, and wanted in that environment. The, the next uh, behavior I was gonna talk about that doesn't respond to medication management is pushing wheelchairs of co-residents. And you'll see sometimes these very helpful um, residents, many of whom had helping vocations in their life. They, many of them were the notorious nurse <laughs> or people who were PSWs in a former life or volunteers in a hospital or who cared for a loved one who had physical disabilities. They're often the ones that are trying to help out by pushing wheelchairs of co-residents or disengaging their their restraints or trying to help them up or into their room or onto the toilet. So these are risky behaviors as well. And they, they're, they don't tend to respond to medication management. And if you've tried to remind people over and over that they can't push wheelchairs, you know that it's much better to give positive reinforcement by assigning a task or giving something meaningful for that person to do than to continuously tell them not to do the same thing that they wanna do. The other behavior that's difficult to manage with medication is um, tugging or pulling on restraints. So these are patients who are in wheelchairs or broda chairs restrained for their safety um, and they tug on them because, you know, obviously they, they are looking for their freedom without recognizing that they need that for safety. So we're gonna talk about some of the, the management strategies. The other thing that's important to recognize is that, um, you know, as I said, non-medication approaches are important for all of these behaviors, but for any behavior, for any behavior that responds to medication or not, non-medication management should always be part of the treatment plan. Kathy, if I could just go back for one second, there was a, one more comment that related to vocalizations. Yes. Um, a comment, what, the comment was, we have had some success by getting a thorough history of, the past, of their past and finding out if something traumatized them. They may become verbally agitated if they're reliving a past trauma, for example, a fear of having pants removed. Absolutely, yeah. So... Um, let me just go back to that. Could you just start that one more time there? Sure. Yeah. So the comment was um, that, that this person has had some success or their team has had some success by getting a thorough history of their, of the, the person's past and finding out if maybe there was some sort of trauma. Um, the suggestion is that they may become verbally agitated if they're reliving a past trauma. Right. I think in all of that, the most important thing is to get to know your patients, know something about your patient. And I think that some, some families have done this, but I really wish that in every long-term care facility, they, they would have it. Um, some facilities have shadow boxes or little curio cabinets outside of their door that give you conversation pieces, it might be their war medals, it might be their wedding picture, it might be pictures of their graduation or um, grandchildren, pets. So that that's really important. I think that before we um, treat residents or patients, we, we have to realize they're all human beings. They've all had a life history and they have a history not just of you know, what they've done in life, but there may also be trauma in that. Um, so all of that's gonna be important. I think that one of the, the best um, 
strategies that I've ever seen, and I didn't put it in the slides here today, was is to have talking points. So these are bright colored sticky notes with very bold black felt pen or, or printed uh, lettering Be at points of care. And this really helps with regular and occasional staff um, with, with getting to know the person. So it might be something as simple as um, you know, Montreal Canadians, like if they're a hockey fan and they were a Habs fan that you might have sticky notes over by the toilet or by the sink where care is delivered to give a clue of what you can talk about with the person while you're delivering care. What's a good distraction? Maybe what their pet name is, you know, a dog named um, Buffy or, um, you know, wife's name is Lucy or favorite grandchild is Dante or something like that. So that, that people who just come into the room have a quick reference to say, what can I talk about to this person? But I think it is important to take one-to-one -one time with everyone to know something about them so that you can talk to them about it. And as you may know, it doesn't have to be something different every time because often people will forget that you talked about it with them before or even that they've spoken to you before. So um, getting to understand people where they come from, were they uh, a stay-at-home mom? Were they a PhD uh, lab tech? Were they uh, a nurse or a teacher? So getting to understand those things is important. I think trauma is also important. And that particularly becomes important when you're entering a person's physical space, particularly for intimate care. If they have a past history of sexual trauma or um, physical trauma, they may respond very negatively to someone entering their personal space. So understanding that is important. I think what is also important is that untrained people in dealing with trauma should not try to work with the patient on that or bring it up or try to work through it with them because inadvertently you can re-traumatize the person by talking about that. But um, the person who did bring that up said just to be aware of that and understand that that may be where the behavior is coming from is that in, in what's happening to, to them or what's happening around them is suddenly helping them to, or making them relive a trauma that they don't want to be back in. So if you notice that somebody is becoming very distressed like that, use your stop and go, reassure, step back, um, reorient the person and maybe even come back a later time. Thank you for that. And there's just one other brief comment. Um, someone mentioned that they love the get to know me book. It's very helpful. Oh yes. Now that is, a book is great, provided it's somewhere where people will see it. And I think that, um, you know, some families I have seen spent hours and hours and hours putting together, together a beautiful dossier with pictures and everything, you know, in the plastic sleeves, in the patient's room, your copy in the chart. And people may or may not have time to read it, especially when you're talking about things like COVID, Nobody's going to be digging through cupboards and drawers looking for books. Um, I think it's really important that we have short summaries of that um, posted at the, at the door of the person, perhaps just to summarize. I was a nurse. I have five children and three grandchildren. My favorite dog was Buffy or, or whatever, um, so that people, people will be able to understand that this is a family person, she loves her dog, she was a nurse or a teacher, and just to understand that. I think it's also really nice to be able to have a book, a photo book, or a Get to Know Me book, if you do have time to sit down for 10 minutes to go through that book with the person and have them tell in their own story what's in the book. So all of those things are great, fantastic ideas. I think that the enemy is always time. Any other questions or? Nope, that's it for now, thank you. Okay, so we'll go through the um, behavioral issues that can happen that are not well treated with um, medications. 
So um, for hoarding or collecting, there is a hoarding apron and this is what it looks like. It's got lots of pockets on it. Um, it looks expensive. It can be made very simply out of a simple apron. It doesn't have to be as elaborate as this. It just gives a place for people to put stuff that they're hoarding so that they don't have to stuff it in their wheelchairs or in their own clothing. Um, it gives a, a sense to staff what they're collecting as well in case there's anything harmful they've got. This also helps if there's food items that it's easy to easier to remove that and clean up the, the mess. Uh, but this is one way of doing it. I've also seen in many facilities, they'll just routinely know where a person hoards or hides things and take the time to clean that area out from time to time. So if somebody um, collects or hoards briefs, for example, they may staff may go by and leave them with two and take out the 25 extra that they've got there. So that it, you know, if they collect things like sugar packets, these things were much more common before the pandemic hit and there's not extra stuff around, but it used to be a real problem as many of you may know with just collecting things from the dining room, food substances and, and hiding them in places. So that's, that's one thing. And again, you know, again, looking at hoarding the risk versus the benefit of medicating somebody for this. You wouldn't medicate someone for hoarding certain objects unless it was to an obsessional degree and people who have obsessive compulsive disorder and they may um, collect things because of anxiety. Sometimes that can be, can be addressed with medications, but in general, Hoarding and collecting is not treated with medications. Inappropriate elimination. So um, this is, again, when people eliminate inappropriately in socially undesirable locations. And marking toilet seats with, um, you know, black toilet seats or red toilet seats are available. It makes them more, uh, visible because of the contrast, but it also provides an aiming target that you can aim at to, uh, to make sure there's less of a mess that may or may not work. Also signs indicating where a toilet is are helpful. Sometimes people are, they know they have the urge to go and they would be successful if they knew where the toilet was. Um, unfortunately, there are people who get advanced in this behavior and will um, actually smear or soil surfaces, which becomes a public hygiene problem. In that case, the use of dignity suits can be used. These are often, they're, well, they're cloth or mesh. Um, there's different designs available so that they, you know, part of it could still be used. So for example, if someone still is um, partially continent, there, there may be the ability to undo part of the garment and use it. Um, or else it can just simply be um, inaccessible for them. And in that case, uh, obviously an incontinence brief would, could be used. In other people, just a regular toileting schedule can be utilized to help with, uh, with partial continence. Eating inedible objects, obviously that can be a big safety risk. And in this situation, of course, the first thing we have to think about is, are they hungry or thirsty? Do they have enough food available to them? And, um, you know, when we're at home and we're sitting around, you've all, you can always get up to go to the cupboard for something to eat or the fridge for something to drink. In long-term care, people suddenly don't have that easily accessible to them. So they may look around or mistake other things for food. They may also be orally fixated. Uh, for example, in people with frontotemporal dementia, they get uh, orally focused and will put things in their mouth more to explore them in their mouth rather than to eat them per se, but there's a huge choking risk in that. So um, making sure there's food available, safety proofing the environment from things, supervision of people that you know will eat inedible objects. Um, keeping things away from them that you know may be harmful. So for example, paper, 
napkins, newspapers, if you know they're, they're apt to rip those and put them in their mouth. Also for people who do have some capability to feed themselves but have difficulty, there are adaptive utensils. What I've shown here in this diagram is brightly colored high contrast um, utensils so that they can be seen by people who are visually impaired. There's weighted utensils for people who have Parkinson's disease to help um, give a counterweight to their tremor so their tremor is less. Lipped bowls and divided plates are often helpful for people with visual impairment or, or just fine motor impairment. Wandering is something that again, um, really calculating the risk and the benefit of keeping people in secure units is a, is a debate. Um, again, you don't want to restrict anyone more than you absolutely have to, but if, if a secure unit is the most important thing, then that, that should be considered. And even in, in secure environments, Camouflaging doorways, as you can see on the left, it's, it looks like an old fashioned buffet. That's actually a doorway if you look closer with an exit sign. And on the right, you'll see an elevator before it was camouflaged and after it was camouflaged so that you can see that um, somebody would be more likely to pass it by. If it opened, they would be less likely to be standing there waiting for it. This is a very clever um, camouflaging device. So a very good painter at the Pearly painted this for us in the vestibule of our specialized behavioral support unit. And um, there's two things hidden there. And what you may see right away is the fire pole, the fire alarm pole there. There's also a keypad that's in the row of windows closer to the door. Um, and you might have to look a little closer to see that. But I, I thought that was very clever. Unclear if that's really in complete compliance with fire regulations, but <laughs> apparently people can see that quite well if they are looking for it. All right. Undress. Oh. Sorry, Kathy, can I interrupt with a question? Absolutely. Okay, so there's um, a question. What is your advice if a resident is eating too fast, dietary is involved, but, but family does not agree? Mm. And I'm presuming the, the family or powers of attorney in this circumstance, I'm just gonna assume that because of the question. So dietitian has, uh, um, has a professional duty as a registered staff to provide recommendations in accordance with their college. And so they, they are very well trained, as you know, in speech and language um, kind of anatomy. And they do swallowing assessments. If they determine that it's not safe for a person to eat a particular texture of food or a particular, you know, to be offered a quantity of food all at once. It's their duty, their professional duty to recommend a particular texture of food like pureed or minced or soft food or regular diet, um, thickened fluids and to what thickness, but also to say one item at a time. And often what we'll see is that um, people who can't inhibit their ability to, to eat more slowly, uh, to eat quickly, um, can choke on food and can aspirate. And of course, aspiration is one of the most common ways in dementia to die. So, um, you know, family have to be told that and they have to be given the decision based on the risk and the benefit of, um, of being offered all their food at once and whatever texture they want. So I think, you know, to have a good discussion with the family asking, you know, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid that they won't get enough to eat? Are you afraid that we're going to be interfering with their autonomy? Um, are they, are you afraid that, um, 
you know, without the person being able to eat as much as they want, that they'll get neglected and people will forget or that their food will get cold and they, they won't be palatable to them. So really looking for the underlying reason for the family's insistence that they have the ability to eat as fast as, as they want to, even if it's dangerous. But I think it's very reasonable for a dietitian and backed up by a family doctor and the registered nurse to say, look, you know, this, this isn't safe. We, can, we promise that we'll continue to offer the food. They can stay there as long as they want until the food is taken, but it isn't safe to give it all at once. All right. Okay. So undressing. Um, this is particular non-medication strategies to deal with that. So again, we see the dignity suit. And this is for somebody who tends to disrobe. This is a little bit better than just using a blue gown, you know, the blue hospital gowns. Um, the blue gowns can be helpful for people where there's such a risk of resistance to care and physically responsive behaviors that care can't be delivered in any other safe way. And in that situation, blue gowns are usually used front and back to provide as much uh, dignity as possible. The dignity suit is um, something that can be tailored to the person. It's made a very comfortable fabric. It be, can be cleaned easily. And many of them look just like real clothing. So they can be, um, it doesn't have to look like an institutional garment. The adaptive clothing you see on the right hand side of that can be a dignity suit in, in the sense that it can be all one piece sewn together, but it can also be in part. So for example, if somebody has um, a lot of rigidity in their shoulders or they've had shoulder surgery and it's very difficult to pull shirts or sweaters over their head, uh, a seamstress can uh, adapt or, or pre-make garments that are slid up the back and can be either tied at the back, more commonly Velcro used at the back, and they can just be laundered that way as well. So that's a really good way to deal with undressing. And it also, we'll talk about it again when we talk about resistiveness to care. Vocalizations. I think, um, you know, if I was to pull you, I wish I could see all your hands, but I'll bet you everyone would stick up their hand if we said, have you ever had an occasion where you felt that you were having a bad day and that some vocalization, vocalizing patient seemed to be contributing to that? I would definitely say yes. And um, I think, again, it's really important to consider why is that person vocalizing? Is there any unmet needs? Is there something we need to address? Are they hungry, thirsty, cold, hot, in pain, anxious, distressed for whatever reason, lonely, bored? Um, you know, you really have to think of all those things every time because each time they vocalize, even if they're saying the same thing or making the same sound, you have to consider that every single time. Finding meaningful, purposeful activities or distraction can be helpful. The use of music player that they might be able to operate themselves like this red um, radio that's available through the Alzheimer's Society. It's very simple. It's got a preset playlist, preset volume, and the person just simply has to open the lid to play it and close the lid to stop it. Um, there used to be an iPod program and there still are some iPods that are around. Recreation therapy staff usually have the ones that are left to provide to residents. And usually um, it's recommended that these are used with the supervision of the staff, simply because you can get tangled in these cords or somebody can um, get injured from it or wander off with it or break it easily and they are expensive. So that's something that can be utilized. It's interesting, you know, you'd think that if somebody's vocalizing a lot um, and you put something on their ears so that they can hear music or, or sounds that are soothing, then it might help with the vocalizations. It's interesting how often that doesn't help. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it works one day on somebody and not the other. So it's really important to consider that vocalizations can be multifactorial as well. 
The other reason why people vocalize often is that they're just tired. They just want to get out of that chair and lie down. So that's another thing to consider. Meaningful activities um, besides music are also important. So something they can do with their hands, like a busy box or tactile quilts, something to keep hands busy can also help. Okay. Sexually disinhibited behaviors can be very, very challenging in long-term care. As I said, intimacy is the normal part of everyday life and people just because they're elderly and just because they're in long-term care don't lose that need for intimacy and touch. So recognizing that that's a normal human response um, of course, you have to assess safety in those situations. So the risk of the person seeking a sexual contact or intimate contact and the person that they're seeking out. So um, the capacity, the capabilities of people to consent. And I'm sure all of you who have teenagers can have told your teenagers, you know, that capacity changes if you're drinking alcohol, your, your capacity goes way down. If you're in a situation where you're being very pressured by peers, your resistance may go down. Um, there's other times where people are, you know, they're alert and they're very with it and they're, they're able to consent. They're seeking out the other person while the person is seeking them out and they're capable of consenting at that time. And in another time, the same couple may not want to consent to the activity. So capacity is fluid. It fluctuates in the same person and from person to person and from situation to situation. So um, capacity is, it, it's an important term to recognize that it can apply to anything. So you can, you can assess capacity to to manage one's finances. You can assess someone's capacity to consent to the use of medications. You can assess someone's capacity to consent to sexual relations. Um, you, can, you can assess someone's capacity to cross the street when there's a traffic light. So, um, you know, these are things that you assess situation by situation. Um, so when you're asking your physician, your power of attorney, it's important to realize that the patient themselves may have capacity in some situations and not in others, and that the power of attorney has to consider what the patient would have wanted as well, not just um, what they feel is appropriate, but to consider what, say, their mother would want. It's important to provide um, appropriate situations and environments for people to have normal sexual activity. So for example, if a married couple who are capable and willing to participate in intimate activities um, expresses that interest, they should be given a private room, perhaps a, a sign on the door to say privacy, please. Um, that's a really important thing to consider and it is uh, the right of people to have that. On the other hand, sexual intimacy in all situations is not, uh, not uh, really a valid uh, statement. You really do have to consider that in some situations it can be risky or unsafe. If you have questions about that specific questions or situations, I'd be happy to answer them. Resistiveness to care, um, this, is, this is where your pieces and GPA training uh, comes into play. So really, um, we have to have an individualized approach for each patient. It's really important to make sure that the patient is comfortable in a comfortable environment, that you understand the needs of the patient, that they have any pre-medication for pain or for anxiety prior to the initiation of care, and that medication is given enough time to work, uh, that all the tools you need, the garments, the incontinence briefs, um, water, cloths, everything is on hand for you so that care can be delivered as quickly, not as quickly, but as smoothly and um, as 
comfortably to the patient as possible. Take your time. If the patient's not willing to proceed, use your stop and go method. Stop, take a step back, wait, make sure you have permission. Really, really important during times when you're using PPE, masks, visors, that the patient is, that you make a meaningful contact with that patient, that they understand what you're asking. Use simple language, brief commands that are clear. Use nonverbal communication gestures if you can to help them understand what's going to happen. And um, other suggestions such as using adaptive clothing if they have pain or restriction in their limbs. Um, real reassurance and providing you know gratefulness to them for participating well and thanking them for allowing you to provide care to them is also important if you have any questions about that one again i'd be happy to address specific situations okay so um repetitive um behaviors that don't seem to have meaning. So things like tapping, humming, um, often it's a sign of boredom over lack of meaningful activity. So providing meaningful activities to people, and that's gonna be different for different people. So what's shown here is it's a basket of baking supplies. So somebody who might've enjoyed working in the kitchen might enjoy having uh, supplies like this. Um, Companion animals might be another thing, stuffed animals. I'm sure you've seen people that respond to baby dolls or stuffed animals. It provides some comfort to have something to hold on to or to rock back and forth. Um, busy boards, things like, uh, I've, I've seen everything from um, like different doorknobs or lock ensembles. To be helpful, what's shown here is a flower box that has flowers that you can take out and put in. And, uh, oh, that's on the next one. Yeah, and here we also show a kitchen setup where it's got a laundry area, a kitchen area, um, dishwashing station, a dining room table. And this is where we see the flower boxes. So anything really to, to keep hands busy and to find some meaningful activity. Some really good suggestions, um, things like folding washcloths or baby clothes. And of course, these aren't for the use of the patients. They can be the same ones. And once they're folded, they go back into the laundry and then a clean basket comes out to be folded again. This can be done with folding shirt protectors or folding um, placemats or napkins. Kathy, we have a couple of questions, if I could jump in with them. Yes, please. Um, so the first one is, as a BSO champion, how can we train staff with care, especially during COVID? By example, <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess that's the best thing. And also, you know, no, during the best of times, we don't have a lot of time. We are so, so fortunate to have the BSO champions and the, the PSWs who have had them in their facility and have built capacity. So I see many, many good PSWs in facilities that far outnumber any challenging uh, staff. And I think that's uh, a kudos to the people who have been behavior support champions over all these years. I think it's also important to have refreshers for courses like pieces and GPA, but there's no substitute for treating, for teaching at the bedside, providing a model and example. Um, also just providing good ideas, praising uh, approaches that are helpful. Um, we all need positive praise and it, we don't always respond best to criticism. It's particularly important if you're going to tell somebody, you know, that you don't like something they're doing, that you do it privately, you know, in a place where they're not in front of their peers, uh, making sure that it's a behavior they can change and not something that's out of their control. So um, 
so that they are able to understand and change it. If you're really struggling after modeling and, and the person's had training to get behavior to change, then go to your registered staff and say, you know, we really need to address this and maybe there has to be some sort of an education plan and a follow-up plan to make sure that those behaviors are, um, are learned and that training is definitely improved. Thank you. Um, the next question is, can you tell us how to manage wandering and exit seeking? in the situation where we do not have signs like you showed us? Oh, the, the camouflages. Mm -hmm. um, mm. You can ask for them. <laughs> I know that some of the, the calls that I've seen actually came from chapters. Um, sometimes on the internet, you can find things to camouflage uh, windows, doors, um, Sometimes there's Mac tech that's available to cover windows or mirrors for people get, that get frightened by their own image in the mirror. They don't know it's themselves. You can put frosted surfaces over there. I guess the other thing is to, to provide really appealing seating areas away from exits. So that, for example, if there's an elevator that when it opens, people can step into it to have a television so that vision the, the attra central attraction in the room is away from the elevator, set up chairs in a way that when people are sitting, they're not seeing exit doors. Um, apart from that, really just supervision is the only thing. The yellow barriers that are um, magnetic and stick to doors or they're stuck on by Velcro can be helpful. Uh, those are particularly helpful for helping patients from wandering into other to co-residence rooms rather than for exits. Even though those can be easily knocked down by running against them, they may be in contravention of the fire rules. I'm not sure about that. For, for main exits, I think that may um, not be allowed. But camouflaging exits uh, can be done. And the person to ask is through the, um, through recreation therapy and um, I know even at some of the facilities that don't have much money, they have pretty good camouflaging things. They're not always the most tasteful things, <laughs> but they do camouflage. They're not something I would want in my living room, for example, but they do camouflage the, the area that's to be camouflaged. The other thing that, uh, that I don't have in here that, that works well for wandering, um, patients that wander into co-residence rooms, I don't know if you folks have seen black holes. What they are essentially is they're, um, if, you, if you're if you old enough to know Bugs Bunny and, and the Red Roadrunner and Willie Coyote, how they sometimes throw down these black circles and the, the uh, Roadrunner or the, the Coyote will drop through where there wasn't a hole. That kind of uh, perspective is, is what people get, even patients without dementia, if you put a black hole like that in front of a doorway. So um, what you'll see is that the exterior side of a, of a residence door, sort of a half circle that looks like an open manhole. And what we've observed is in using that, that the residents will walk around that as if it's really a hole. So it keeps them from going into the residence room. And we found that in some residents that that works even better than the yellow banner does. So that's something else. Again, you can, there are links to, uh, to, to uh, places that you can get those materials. And certainly you can get a hold of me or you can get a hold of the Royal Ottawa Outreach Program to talk about those kinds of devices if they're not available in the resources at the end. I'm open to uh, that contact. Thanks for all those ideas. Okay. Um, yeah, there, are couple, there are a couple of other questions. Um, two are sort of similar. One, um, it's asking about keeping people in their rooms? Is it possible to isolate a person with dementia in their room? Not really. I think, you know, we've seen heroic attempts at this. And again, you know, you always have to consider even for something like this, what is the risk versus the benefit of doing that? And I can tell you without a doubt that I have had more of my patients die from hip fractures because of deconditioning secondary to isolation than I've had die of COVID. 
So I think, yes, public health protocol says we should keep people isolated in their rooms. It was for two weeks before, you know, it's, it's changing um, somewhat now. It is cruel to keep people in their rooms isolated like that. And some people, even if they completely understand the reason, find it cruel and inhumane to do that. What we've found works best, um, and unfortunately it's an expensive solution, but it's, it's certainly a more humane solution. Some patients will just get up and wander and somebody just has to follow after them and wipe every surface that they touch. And that seems to be the only way to deal with it. So um, I know that I've heard people say, we can keep people and pa patients in their room. And then I go and look and they've got their foot against the door or a television against the door or they're barricaded in. And I think that's, that's not safe. That's not legal. Um, yes, you can use medications if the POA proves using that, but otherwise, really, you're just going to have to follow that person around and wipe down the surfaces and deal with the consequences. The other thing is, is that early on in the pandemic, we really believed that it was important to clean every surface um, and that COVID lived on surfaces for days and days. And we know now that that's not true and that the science behind wiping down surfaces is very weak. And Dr. Peter Uni says that this um, obsessive wiping down of surfaces is not necessary. Um, still, there are protocols to do that. And I still think that, yes, of course, you don't want people wandering around touching everything. But also, I think there's something to be considered about the risks of, of keeping people isolated for such a prolonged period of time. Absolutely. Yeah, so a few other questions. Um, how do you suggest managing inappropriate sexual behavior between two residents on a secure unit? Well, um, firstly, the you have to consider again that capacity is fluid. So if if, for example, they're both decidedly incapable, so they both are completely unable to consent. Um, and there is a risk. So say one of them has HIV and the other one has hepatitis C and there's a huge risk for these two having intimate relations, then you have to uh, make other considerations. So either somebody has to be put on one-to-one -to, -one to make sure that any contact, any intimate contact between these residents is prevented, or you have to consider moving one to a different unit so that those two um, aren't in contact with each other. Now, having done that and seen different solutions proposed and different solutions tried, I can tell you that sometimes it's not specific to the person. Sometimes it is as easy as that person looks like his wife who passed away a year ago. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, that's, that's a person who was in that room and that's where my wife used to be or, you know, whatever. It, it could be just that it's a female or a male. So there's really no absolute way to keep people safe unless they have one-to-one -one when they're awake or unless you move them physically from one unit to another. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so there's a comment. Um, Jillian has shared that her coworker, Andrea at the Pearly does a lot of di diversion doors. She did some of them that are included in your presentation. Yeah, actually, Andrea did that, um, the really nice um, uh, one with the fire alarm and the keypad hidden in it that's in the vestibule at the SPSU. Okay, awesome. So yeah, so Jillian's oh, offering. Yeah. Yeah, she's included her, uh, her email. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so if people are interested, looking in the chat, in the chat um, Jillian King, well, it's gking at pearlyhealth.ca, um, and she could connect you up with Andrea. Perfect. There's another one in here that Andrea did. It's the theater. Um, oh, it's on the next slide. Okay, so there yeah, we go. Yeah. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Amazing. <laughs> that's, on the, that's on the Specialized Behavioral Support Unit. And the residents just love it there because it is just like a theater. They sit around and they have the movies on and they're not too loud. And, they, you know, it's, it's a really nice environment. Yeah, that's so, lovely. Um, that's, that's a very successful intervention, yeah. 
Yeah, Andrea also did a really nice family um, sitting room for, for our SPSU with a fireplace and curtains and it's just beautiful. So yes, these really do make it feel like home, not just for the residents, but for the family. And it helps them to relax and feel that their loved one is in a, in a home-like environment as well. And that's important too. Yeah, so we've got the theater and we've got um, the kitchen laundry room, things like open dining rooms that have bright windows, bistro, little bistro station. Um, that's a really nice one. Uh, that one particular one I think is at the Glebe Center and there's really nice ones at Villa Marconi as well. Um, outdoor courtyards are really nice. They tend to be places that are challenging to, um, to make completely safe for people uh, because you know they're uneven surfaces and they, there does have to be some supervision in there. But my goodness, even a small bit of fresh air for people and sunshine in the summer is so amazing to patients, especially if there's something little that they like tomatoes they're growing or flowers that are growing that they can help out with. So that's uh, that contributes to a home-like environment. There's also, I don't know if Andrea did this painting on the bottom right corner, these, these um, unique home-like doors. That's at the Glebe Center. And uh, what's really nice is that's in the secure unit, but they're visual cues for people to find their own room. And just because they're so much more identifiable, I think it reduces the wandering as well because people won't wander into their room. If they recognize that it's not their specific door front, they won't go into that room. Sense. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, they're amazing. So yeah, there are lots of comments. There's several comments now talking about how great Andrea is and her work and her mom. And so yeah. Okay, great, good, good. good. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, it's great. And in the bottom left, I don't know if Andrea did that too, but that's uh, it's um, to the entrance of the secure unit at the Glebe Center, and it's a it looks like a you know a children's daycare or a school where it has little cubby holes with children's things in it. So it, it feels very much like home. Okay. Other things that we use, um, you can see here, I was talking about the kind of mat tack or one-sided sticky wallpaper that goes over mirrors. Um, it can also be used to, to hide things behind windows and, you know, we make offices secure but it, it specifically helps for residents that when they look at themselves in the mirror, they don't recognize themselves and they may shout or become angry when they're in, when they're in their bathroom because they don't recognize their own reflection. Um, that brightly colored green shape is actually an ear. And what that is, that's a, a, that's a device we, uh, we stole from a Chio, but we borrowed the idea. We didn't actually steal the device from Chio. And what it does is when the environment gets noisy, the ear gets red and it's a visual reminder that we're being too noisy. So that's in the dining room in the specialized behavioral support unit right by the uh, food station. So it's a good reminder for all of us when we're in the dining room that to keep our, our volume down and it helps keep vocalizations and behaviors down as well. You can see the um, you can see my colleague Tatjana there in the half door. She's um, demonstrating the half door at the at the nursing station. You know how residents will often come to the nursing station, bang on the window or bang on the door. This provides a, a sense to them and a sense to us too that we have a connection with the resident without worrying about the safety of the resident wandering into the nursing station where there may be things that are not safe. Um, and we also don't want to get barricaded into the nursing station by a resident who, you know, who doesn't mean to do that and we can't get around them. Um, but this, this provides a reassurance to the residents. It also lets us to be able to stand up and see what's going on in a room without actually having to enter the space. And if something's going on, you know, we can call a cold white, shut the door if we're in danger and keep ourselves in there. The yellow barricade or uh, the banner is up in the upper right corner. That's the magnetic one that I was talking about. In some facilities, they're uh, Velcro and they're, they're not uh, a tripping hazard in the sense that if you were to walk into them or run through them, they do come off. Um, but um, they're also, I mean, there is, there is some risk to using them. 
but uh, certainly they, they do provide a good reminder, visual reminder and physical reminder to people not to wander into that room. The strange looking blue lighted object in the bottom is a blanket warmer. And um, that is um, something that I think many facilities have discovered and probably need to rediscover. Lots of facilities have these donated by family members. What they are is they're essentially heat, warm, heat warming stations where you put blankets in them and they warm up blankets. And it has surprised me over the years how many patients respond to just a warm blanket being draped over them. And that can be in care settings. Um, for example, if they were receiving just care at the bedside, a warm blanket over them so they're not chilly, a warm blanket after a shower or a bath, um, a warm blanket after they've had their meal just to help them settle and be quiet. So that, that's something that many facilities do have and it does take a step to fill it up and warm up the blankets. But if somebody has that task or takes the time to do it every day, you can use those blankets throughout the shift to assist in help preventing behaviors. Okay, delirium. You, if you have people from the Royal Ottawa that you interact with, you know the first thing we say when uh, behavior is reported to us, particularly if it's new behavior, is did you check the urine? Is a urine culture been collected? So um, that's because delirium, the most common cause for delirium is a urinary tract infection. What delirium is, it's a sudden change in the behavior of the patient. So it might be something they've experienced before, but suddenly it's happening more often. So for example, a person may be more confused, be uh, ask more questions repetitively, be much more irritable, um, hallucinate more frequently or, or continuously. They might be more paranoid. They might misinterpret things that are going on around them. Suddenly they're up at night, whereas they were sleeping before and sleepy during the day. Maybe um, that's in a hyperactive delirium. In a hypoactive delirium, people may take to their bed. They may be uncharacteristically sleepy or appear withdrawn. So a sudden change in behavior should trigger a delirium workup. Underlying causes for delirium are medical causes, most commonly urinary tract infections, but other infections such as wound infections, um, lung infections, respiratory infections, all of those can cause, uh, can be an underlying cause. And side effects of medications is another cause for delirium. So anything that's what we call anticholinergic that can cause constipation or urinary retention, um, those can contribute to delirium as well. So it's really important to treat the underlying medical cause of a delirium. So in summary, um, delirium, or sorry, treatment of behaviors for dementia has to be tailored individually to the person that, uh, that we're trying to um, help with their behaviors. The, besides the individualized care approach, we also have to consider that dementia itself does not cause all behaviors. There's many other things that cause behavioral disturbance as we went through. So all physical, psychiatric problems, environmental causes, the causes uh, related to boredom, loneliness, the need for social interventions or even spiritual interventions have to be considered in every patient. Medication strategies can work for some behavioral disturbances. All behaviors should be treated with non-medication approaches and many behaviors respond only to non-medication approaches. And these are some of the resources and I appreciate that Andrea will also provide her, her contact information. If anybody else has information about um, resources, I'd really appreciate if you'd share them with us as well. I know that uh, 
our resource list isn't isn't complete here either. If there's a specific need you have, definitely you can email Carl or um, or Tamara, and they can get, they can forward emails on to me. I'd be very interested if people have comments or other questions at this point in time. Everybody asleep? <laughs> yeah, no, there, there's some comments, like people appreciating uh, the ear, the noise identifier, the blanket towel warmer, um, a comment, uh, someone who used to use throw blankets in the dryer on the unit for a yeah. cheaper alternative to a blanket warmer, um, appreciation for the half door at the nurse's station. Um, another comment, we've had success with the comfort chair that rocks and has quiet music. Um, a question if the PowerPoint presentation is available and um, and just appreciation for the presentation that was very informative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the PowerPoint presentation will be available. Carl will let you know how. And um, yeah, I think that we can always use innovative strategies. Even after all the decades I've worked on this job, I will learn something every day from the patients, the families, my colleagues. So I think that's what makes this field exciting is that there's, there's always something you can learn from somebody else. So lots of thank yous, Kathy, a lot of appreciation that this was very helpful, always informative. Um, yes, just a constant stream of thank yous. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, oh, wow, that's a lot of thank yous. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I, can't wait to, I can't wait to see you all when COVID is over. Yeah. I, I so miss going out and seeing you all and, and being with you. It's, it's nice since, uh, since we've been able to come into facilities, but I still, many of you know that I'm visually impaired and I, I can't see who anyone is in PPE. So I can't wait to see the smiles again. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I'm just going to put the, uh, the post session survey into the chat here uh, for, for everyone. And I'll, uh, if you have any trouble accessing it, you can email me or you can wait a few days and I'll, I'll email it out to everyone again, along with uh, the recording and, and the slide deck will be in that email too. <laughs> there are so many comments coming in. I feel like I should read out a couple. Okay. Um, thank you. Very informative. And uh, thank you very much. Lots of those. <laughs> great ideas shared. Awesome presentation. And uh, great ideas to bring forward to our facility. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. And uh, it's great having you all today. It looks like we had about 90 folks here today, which I think is our, our record for this series. So um, that's great. And uh, have a good evening, everyone.